All right, guys, we are, we're now recording. So today our task, we're trying to design the homepage as the big level. The, our project's grown a lot. Um, we've all been interacting a lot more over the last few weeks. And the homepage that we have right now is um, basically from a couple of years ago when Greg and I first, and Raf, Raf Walker, we were first meeting up with Seth at DWeb and just kind of going out starting to meet people and we're going to the IETF and it's all talking about the protocol. But we have the sense that the project's a lot bigger and that we have a lot of interests that bind us. Now that we're all here together, um, I think that, well, it's, it's time for us to revise the homepage and talk about the bigger project that we're all in. And to do that, I think it's gonna help a lot for all of us to put our thoughts together so that we can see what we all want in this project, what we're all excited about. And that'll give us clarity on what the big picture is so that we can refine it together and then put that out as what great is. So I'm kind of excited about this. Also, this is the first time where I've been, like I've been feeling like this project, like we're coming together as a group and we have a lot of common spirit and ideas. And I'm noticing like, a bunch of us are starting to connect on like, oh, I've been wanting to do this thing. It's like, oh yeah, I want to do that thing too. So that to me says that there is something common that's uniting us and that we can figure it out by talking about it together. So, um, so the idea for this being the format of it is that we'll go around kind of round robin Okay, and everyone, you can either make an order, or you can just kind of volunteer and go. And when you do speak, say what excites you about what you'd like Braid to be and see if you could um, you know, speak from the heart, I think, since a lot of this is gonna be coming from our, from our guts and we're gonna figure out over time what is like proper or what's in common. But I think if we can start by understanding like what we're excited about, then that'll allow us to start to see the pattern over time. And so when, when we do speak, um, we'll also want to see if we can reference what people have said in the past. And if there's stuff that you really liked in what they said, then you can affirm it in what you say. And um, then we'll start to see a pattern of what we have in common that way. And if you see stuff that's missing in what they're saying, then this is a great opportunity for you to put voice to that so that it enters into our shared story. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Now, does anybody want to start? Or any questions, any thoughts also like about uh, what would you like this meeting to be? Yeah. I have a, um, a question. Um, uh, how long? Like, if I went first, how long would I talk? We've got two hours and six people right now. So I'm guessing talk, talking for a few minutes would be a good, great place to start with the guideline. Um, and we can, we can revisit and repeat. I also set up a web page, by the way, um, grade.org slash meeting slash homepage. Let's go ahead and get the little chat thing. Um, so we've got a little wiki page there and we can kick, take notes on that page, which I think would be really nice too. And, and so I'm thinking like, so when you, when you speak, for instance, I'm going to edit that page right now. Um, let's do the share screen button. This button, this button. Okay. So when you're, so maybe when you go, you can, I might be like, here's my thing. And I can take bullet points about what I'm thinking here, or someone else can take notes too. It'd be nice to have people volunteer as scribes as other people are speaking. Um, but you might want to edit your section too. So then over time, we'll just have like a big list of stuff. And this way we'll capture what everyone's perspectives are. At the end of all of this, um, people online or asynchronously can also submit videos about what they're thinking or add to the wiki page or add a mailing list post. So we can kind of keep this conversation ongoing probably, you know, it might even, might even just continue to do this as we're going, as we're working on the project over the next set of years. Okay. 
Okay, any, any thoughts, questions? Makes sense. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, does anyone want to start? Does anyone want me to start? I, <laughs> I'm willing for you to start. I'm also willing to start myself. I have a few thoughts too. I could, any, yeah, any order is good. I'm willing to roll a dice. I, I could go as well. So if we want to roll a dice, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm game for rock paper scissors as well. Okay, so everyone says they're willing to go, but nobody is volunteering. <laughs> I'm. Is there a difference? I'm volunteering to go. Okay, go. All right. Um. There's braid, and there's like a speak from the heart of what I like what my, my own personal interests. Sorry, I wanted to start a timer so that I can know how long. I'm gonna talk for three minutes about what braid means to me. Um, <clears throat> and I haven't prepared anything, but there's um, one part that's kind of just, I've been working on that's connected with braid is a, is a synchronizer and CRDPs in general that synchronizer in particular. Um, but more general than that, like the thing that is kind of exciting to me about the idea of linking together with people's state is I, um, one uh, like phrase that Mike has, has thrown out that connects with me is this idea of uh, accessing state is easier as a local variable, even if that state exists on a different machine. Um, in general, I connect very much with the idea of things being simple uh, and programs interoperating easily with each other. I, I like the idea of computing uh, being a place that is uh, fun and easy to interact with for programmers. And I think that there's a lot of interest in general in user interface with making things easy for the common man who doesn't know how to program and wants buttons and stuff. Uh, but I am not that person. And there are lots of people who are not. And I have an interest in a user interface for the computer. Uh, and for me, that user interface is programming. And I love programming, and I work all the time doing it. And all the time, I'm, I'm forever trying to make it easier, more pleasant <laughs> as a programmer to do stuff. Uh, and one of the things that often comes up is synchronizing state. Um, and Braid is very connected with synchronizing state. Uh, it's, um, and it's kind of, I mean, in this meeting, we'll see <laughs> where exactly its boundaries lie. Um, like in the sense, like the, where my heart is, I am, I, like I care very much about synchronizing state, anything beyond that. Well, there, you know, there's lots of ways to synchronize state. And I have, um, I, I have interest in protocols that are you know very narrow and constricted around a particular like I could see synchronizing state around like that five seconds till the three minutes I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna stop but I'll just finish that sentence I was gonna say I could I could see synchronizing state around uh, just JSON in, in a very particular um, set of things that are allowed in this JSON and a particular CRDT all the way to you know a, a protocol that's just in very general around synchronizing state. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Great, thanks Greg. Uh, so I've got these notes here. A lot of synchronization and CRDTs, you seem to mostly be um, like accessing network state as easily as local variables seem to be a big thrust of your points and making things easier for programmers. The key point in there is 
making synchronized state easier. And a lot of this comes from the idea of the UI to the computer that is programming. So you want, like you care about the UI, you care about the API as if it's a UI, like you want it to be well-designed, so it's simple and easy to, to do stuff. Great. Um, and yeah, any, any uh, quick thoughts on re reply to Greg or does anyone else want to jump in? I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's a very strong position for Braid to be in, uh, offering those things. So same, same appeal for me as well, coming as a programmer. I'd love to have collaborative editing in Vim be mathematically correct. <laughs> I've wanted that for a long time, so I feel that Greg's the programmer's programmer. <laughs> we'll be standing on his shoulders. <laughs> um, I have I have some thoughts. If I if I could go, is that all right? Great. Um, so my my entryway into Braid um, comes with some history in um, sort of the blockchain uh, orientation of thinking. Um, it's very exciting in 2011 or whatever, Bitcoin came out in 2009. And then um, it seemed like there was this, uh, this sort of stone rolling forth to fill the world that was like blockchain, blockchain oriented. It was, everything's gonna be blockchain. And um, there was a period of time where I agreed and then I, I kind of became disillusioned. I was like, oh my gosh, um, it has some really big flaws and this is not the solution for everything. And um, I guess the point I wanna bring here is that <clears throat> I think blockchain heralded a movement that was hard to describe and I would call it cooperative computing. Um, it's this, era when we realized that the centralized sources that we trust are flawed in some ways and then we looked to blockchain as the savior and realized that it isn't all that um, there's something else that we're missing and um, I just wanted to point out a few little technologies here that kind of relate to blockchain that I think are all in our space so the idea of immutable logs was something that was very popular and um, that was kind of blockchain related, but then um, technologies like auto merge and YJS took that and said, yes, we like that uh, immutable logs, let's do that. Um, then we also have IPFS, which was saying uh, we wanna cooperate as a swarm or a, a decentralized content addressable um, file system. And, um, you know, not everyone agreed, like you, sh you should be able to delete things or you should be able to, um, uh, incentivize uh, things and there were forks and you know there's see a coin and there's file you know, file coin and there's all sorts of things that were basically experimenting in this realm and so um, to me braid is um, a very interesting nexus of capabilities in this search space for social computing and solutions in social computing in in cooperative computing and to me what it means is um, the immutable log is, is optional. Um, the blockchain capabilities, we, we want them, but they're, they're not um, core. You don't, have to, you, ha you don't have to create these thick clients that have like forever databases and it's just huge load to, to try to be a, a blockchain node. What if you could just take HTTP and add the little pieces that you need so that everyone can cooperate together without behemoth companies being sort of our overlords in every um, aspect of our lives. And um, I want that. That's the piece that, that uh, is really appealing to me. And, and I think, you know, immutable logs and content addressability, they're great, but that may not be the solution for everything. And I think Braid is saying, here's, here's the core pieces that we must have, and you can tack those things on. You could even create a blockchain on Braid. That's great. Um, but we aren't uh, forcing you to have everything. Great. Yeah. So there's this, um, so one thing about what we're doing is creating optional pieces that people like 
take these features and add them into the existing web or you know instead of like okay guys we've got to start a revolution and build rebuild everything on top of this other fully distributed system um and that's also i i, I get that distinction in uh we haven't started with a fully peer-to-peer -peer distributed transport although Bryn has been working very well towards that but we have a lot of these other features that we can break off piecemeal and add them in um, and use them as we need to and and this is building towards a, a vision of cooperative computing in particular and Part of cooperation, it feels like clicks with making things optional so that it's easier for people to get involved. You can cooperate on whichever aspects you want to. Yeah, you attract alignment rather than forcing uh, forcing um, compliance. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, attracting alignment. So it's like a, a value add, positive only, no forcing of compliance. I just wanted to second, uh, well, I like the idea, I think, it, I think it's a, uh, I agree with the idea um, that kind of the thing at the top there of the notes that blockchains sparked a bigger movement in cooperative computing. Um, I, I agree for, for me, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff around money with blockchain, but also the computing side is very, like, I, I agree with you, Duane. I think it um, kind of showed people, or I, I mean, you know, there were cooperative <laughs> computing things before, but somehow um, you, you, you bridged a connection in my mind there. I think uh, there's something to interest around cooperative computing. Oh, Ethereum is like a computer. Anyway, I'm going to... I think blockchain's roots were political as well, um, coming from, uh, 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 sorry, I'm forgetting the uh, anarchy, anarchist kind of mindset that, that it came from, but um, it was very political in its ideology. And so I think it, um, it, it illuminated boundaries around ideologies where previous cooperative computing technologies hadn't, except possibly like, uh, 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 digital sharing um, files. What's that called? Uh, you know, when we had peer to peer sharing of, of uh, music videos and BitTorrent and those yeah. kinds of things, Napster, Kazaa. Napster, thank you. Yeah. Napster felt political because it was like, hey, you're taking away my rights. Um, so I think that might be the only similar movement that I saw um, in cooperative computing. But blockchain brought money too, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, there was kind of a, a link, I guess, from Napster to to BitTorrent to Bitcoin. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, it sounds like you you might almost be saying, Dwayne, that what we're doing is less political. It's like more. It's like we're not because we're not trying to force. We're not playing with zero sum games as much. We're just like, let's make everything work together. Um. I'm not saying that directly. I agree with what you're saying, but I think what I'm what I'm highlighting is that we exist inside of a political struggle right now that was sparked by what I would say is the blockchain movement, and, mm. and a lot of people are interested in what we're doing. Decentralization in general is a big, you know, DeFi, decentralized finance. Like everything is um, orbiting around that uh, axis that was created by blockchain. And to some yeah. some extent, Napster. Like in that sense, I think what you're saying is that, to some extent, Braid is sort of like if you were to draw a circle around blockchain stuff, some of Braid would actually be in that circle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think people value what we have to offer because their awareness came from um, the feelings they had when they joined the revolution. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I know that, um, you know, I've been interested in cryptocurrencies for quite a while and also felt that like over time, um, I, I saw that my interest from it in it 
related to a lot of other people's interests, but there are all these differences. And then those differences started to create fracturings and communities. And a lot of people started getting really hard edge and putting that hard edgedness into this currency or that currency. And, um, and so it feels like we're in that space somehow. And certainly we have our own perspective and our own driving motivation, which is what we're trying to put together right here. Um, but it does seem distinct, and it also seems to be somehow like a, you know, more of a kit, like let's let's just include everything to some degree. So there's some kind of slight difference in attitude, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know, don't know what words to use there. I'd love to hear people's words and try to articulate that too, and maybe we'll, we'll just figure it out over time. Um, cool. Does anyone want to speak? Yeah. I'll go next. All right, I've got some scribbles here on a piece of oh, notes from you guys have talked. Everything, I, nothing you said was unfamiliar. Um, although I am coming to this blockchain nitty gritty, basically, uh, basically with this. Um, I've, I've only been reading up until now. Uh, with uh, the beginning of a Sync9 implementation, I guess I'm <laughs> starting to write. Um, but my sort of world is the World Wide Web. And it all started for me with HyperCard. I wanted to know if any of you have used that way back in the day. Yeah? Okay, so, oh man, I'll post it to chat, but there's this video of the two creators demoing it. It's like from the, I don't know, 70s, or 80s. Uh, and when they're going through the hyper media system that they created, it's so sticky and useful. Uh, when they, they were obviously using it to the best of their ability. And um, I, I, I frequently go back to that when I see us sort of like reinventing wheels in the World Wide Web world. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, I just love the web <laughs> and I don't want to lose the web in any way, shape or form. I see Braid as this beautiful step into the new world while giving you the ability to keep yourself firmly planted in the real world. Um, the ability to start taking a step into blockchain while staying on the web. And that really appeals to me because I've always had these uh, fantasies of blockchain stuff being put on the web because I just see directed ASIC uh, DAGs with hyperlinks and people's websites. And uh, that seems pretty powerful in and of itself, but slow. Uh, and obviously what you guys are working on is real time, which is fast. And you're using different underlying technologies, which I'm still trying to grasp fully. But as I read more about it, it seems like the perfect complement, what we've been missing on the web, what's kept it, what's, what's kept it out of the spotlight uh, in all this blockchain talk. It, 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 it's like everybody wants to throw it away and move to something greater, but nobody really says it quite like that, but they also don't hide it. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, Kazaa was a beautiful uh, experience <laughs> sharing music, Napster. Um, I had a collection that was lost in a hard drive and uh, it was, it would have been proof of what was capable in a decentralized system without borders, so to speak. Uh, it, the creativity that came from the remixes is unrivaled. SoundCloud is close, but it's been tainted in a way that peer-to-peer -peer never would have been. Um, I want that back, and I see all of the above connected somehow. <laughs> I know it's connected. I'm still pulling at the braids. <laughs> I don't know. How long was that? <laughs> 
<laughs> how on point, how descriptive. That's great. Um, yeah, so I've got a bunch of notes here about um, the web has a lot of good to it. There were these visions from the 70s and the 80s that were very powerful and like they're the right decisions. In some sense, they're very sticky. They've stuck with us. That vision is still living in you. And there's this new wave of technology that's not maybe not respecting it or not acknowledging the value in it and ends up reinventing the wheel or trying to. Um, but Definitely. The value and putting it together. Yeah, and, and I think especially you're saying that one thing that the web has been missing is being real time and fast. And yeah, that was great, great note taking. Thank you. <laughs> I could have said that all much quicker. <laughs> great. Yeah, thanks, Angelo. Well said. Any other, uh, that get, get, get anyone thinking anything? Or does anyone want to go? Or, or yeah, I, I could riff off uh, uh, Angelo. He kind of brought in that nostalgic vibe and kind of painted a uh, nice picture, which extended off what Dwayne said. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, I saw a lot of potential in the D-Web for scale uh, for indie programmers. Like, hey, we can now, because I tried a lot trying to build, say, a decentralized YouTube, uh, but trying to do it as an indie dev with no funding uh, is pretty much impossible unless you have uh, things uh that make collaborative content hosting possible so then i got into like ipfs like the dweb and also torrents uh torrents more than just download downloading movies uh big buck bunny in the open source ones of course <laughs> but, but the uh uh the but one of the things i found is they are uh, kind of over promised and under delivered uh, a lot of it was um a lot of money in there kind of, I guess, caused that culture a little bit. Uh, and at the end, it was kind of a lot of overkill for what I actually wanted or needed. Uh, and then there was DAT, which then became like the hypercore protocol. And that was like an append only log. And there was a lot of focus now on append only logs, which is a, kind of a blockchain. And I was like, well, that's still overkill for most apps. Uh, so it's been trying to find something that can kind of enable the indie dev to achieve mass scale. And then eventually I found Braid. I'm like, okay, this is great. I get all the sync stuff or the fancy uh, stuff for the existing web stack that I and everyone else is already familiar with. So we can get a lot of these benefits of a synchronous, like a synchronizing web. I, I mean, yeah, synchronizing web uh, without reinventing the uh the whole stack and to me that seemed a lot more powerful and a lot more adaptable uh for the type of apps people kind of want to build rather than having to think how can i re-implement my entire stack on new tech that is unproven sweet yeah so that... hearing, yeah go ahead. Uh, so i i'll just i'm so i'm hearing in this um that you're an indie dev and you want to you see a lot of great promise in the distributed web or like the indie web this kind of style of work but a lot of the software out there is over promising and under delivering is kind of like like trying to say the whole web can be reimagined on this basic technology that's like gonna end up being overkill in some dimensions you know maybe it's good in some dimensions for some types of apps but we need some basic infrastructure that makes it easy to build and the web has already provided something that works. A lot of people are familiar with it. And so um, maybe this makes it easier for us to get mass scale because you can kind of go from it. Right. Well, one of the other things just to add on to my points is uh, the reinventing the entire stack causes, you know, if there's a culture around that, then you end up with a culture that wants to have multiple ways of reinventing the entire stack with their own vision. Uh, and that to me doesn't seem it just it's right now it's just creating a bunch more silos and the goal is everyone is promising interoperability but then it's all within their own silos uh and then raid came along and it's like well you don't need to to do that <laughs> at all we can uh give you all the benefits from very smart people who are very collaborative and open <laughs> uh, in a way that can break down those silos 
Yeah. Yeah, like if our goal is to break down silos, then people start creating distributed infrastructure, and then each new infrastructure becomes its own silo. Sorry, that was me typing. I guess we can't <laughs> type at the same time, huh? Um, oh, it moves the cursor, doesn't it? Oh, I should fix that bug. I'll erase my stuff. There we go. We're good. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, a uh, clarifying question here, um, Ben, around, you mentioned that lots of money killed the culture. And I was curious, I, I, I think I re, I typed killed the culture because I think that's what I heard. But did you want to um, clarify that? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, I, what you were saying there. Uh, yeah, well, I think when there's investor money in it and you have a lot of people who are uh, not particularly, like a lot of newbies, I guess, in the culture as well, who now see a ton of money, there's a thing of also over-promising uh, to the investor and very much like everything's fine, we can, uh, 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 you know, we'll be able to deliver uh, as well. And uh, it it ends up causing a situation just as well with general business culture that I see, which is like opaque and uh, competitive, where it's like, let's, uh, you know, we're in a competitive landscape, there's money involved, there's livelihoods involved. Uh, so whatever will make us win and hurt the competition is also good, uh, while at the same time, we smile and shake hands. Uh, so that's one of the unfortunate things uh, that promotes great competition uh but it's not particularly if you're wanting interoperability it's nice to find uh, also a culture that is actually open and interoperable and they reveal their cards and their vulnerabilities uh rather than just promising everything oh well said i've got tingles and i totally agree thank you for clarifying that <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question too. That inspires me to go too. Um, if, could somebody take notes? I'd like to do a little riff on that. Um, yeah, I can, I can take one. Okay, great. Um, so I think something that you're pointing at there, Ben, is the, the, the cultures of technological development haven't been fostering the kind of work that we need. And I'd say like that's been a culture largely of Silicon Valley venture capital backed startups that took off from the web in like the late 90s. The web was invented in 91. And then business model, people were like starting to make startups, you know, 96, 97, 98. Um, and didn't even know if there was gonna be a business model then, but some people started to believe in it. And then, and you got this culture of trying to build on top of the web and very little questioning of, or contributing to the web itself. Because when you're building a startup, you're just, your perspective on standards is how can I, <laughs> how can I sort of use this however I can to get the features I need? And so there's been an underinvestment in developing the basic web infrastructure, or even questioning it. I think there's a big belief that the web is good or you know has some goodness. And that's being questioned now maybe with the distributed web. But um, I think that a, you, we're taking a unique approach by questioning some basic elements of the web architecture, such as the request response cycle and the client server part of HTTP. Like HTTP, the semantics of it hasn't changed since the very beginning. I think they added post in <laughs> a little bit, you know, down, down the line, um, post and put. We're adding subscriptions, we're adding versioning, we're breaking, so we're, like we're adding a little bit of statefulness. And, and this is giving the web the ability to handle mutating state. And we're able to do this, I think because we're not trying to make money either as a venture backed thing or as a token that's trying to capture some huge amount of the market because the original web didn't make money either. And, um, I think that I, my perspective on the IETF, I think we're, we're, I feel very common with the IETF and the indie web movement. None of, neither of those are we're trying to make money. The indie web is not, is, is also interesting because it's not like a single protocol. It's not a single platform. It's, it's a distributed group of people that is trying to interoperate. And the IETF is the same idea. It's a distributed group of people trying to interoperate. Um, but I see in, right in what we're doing here, 
there's some depth to it because synchronization is really hard. <laughs> it's really complicated and you have to go super deep. So I think that there's some power in us coming together and bonding over something deeper and investing in pretty hardcore technology. Um, and that's like, I think it's meaningful that we're working on these hard algorithms for CRDTs, operational transform. We're looking at them from different perspectives and trying to come together there. I think it's gonna create some kind of, require some group here. And um, so I, I see that as maybe our, like a cultural distinction for us. And so I, th I think we're, we're going deeper into the standards and also trying to build a strong community that is going deep into the technology and building stuff together. And I think we're also like the original web and the spirit of the original web creating applications. Like we're gonna, we're, we're building stuff. Um, we're hacking together things. And that's gonna create the beginnings of this new layer of, of the web, this new braided web. Um, and I wanna, if I can uh, take, I just wanna add four bullet points. I'm gonna take the console and add four bullet points um, here. So I see us, um, we have in our what we're doing. We're we have to work on four different things, roughly maybe just three of them. I don't know about like we're building standards. We're also writing these libraries. We're also building apps, and then we've been doing some algorithmic development because we have to like understand the, the underlying models and what's going to happen mathematically in order to, to put the standards and build all this stuff together. And I think so far the Braid project has been focused on the standards, at least visibly publicly. If you go to the braid.org homepage, it says we are synchronization for HTTP, but we're now writing some libraries and apps and um, doing some algorithmic work. And so I can see us expanding our work areas into maybe these four categories or something like this. And I'd be very interested in also in us talking about what we want in these libraries. So for instance, uh, Greg up here was talking about accessing network state as easily as a local variable and making things easy for programmers. And that means we want to have some really nice libraries with great APIs. Um, and um, Angela, I think we were talking about HyperCard. You're seeing this web vision that's going to involve a lot of interesting apps that are going to be real time. And we're going to be able to do stuff that we've been missing. And so I think it will be great for us to be brainstorming what these apps look like as well. Um, OK, I yield the conch. So I uh, was, I've been <laughs> reading up on CRDTs and the uh, best article that I found said that, you know, it isn't perfect for every use case. So I feel like that's where it fits into the perfect uh, hybrid environment where you have standard web operations right there, like on par with the braid uh, synchronization. Um, and you have both tools available to you. And which means braid can be sprinkled onto any existing website, as long as they click the upgrade button on their web server. their existing website, the one that gets, you know, all of the traffic for their monthly revenue today. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it exists. It's the perfect path way <laughs> towards so, future tech. <laughs> yeah, pathway towards future tech. Let me that too. I consider like of most of what we've been talking about, uh, the future tech, right? <laughs> Semi-proven blockchain-esque uh, experiments, yeah. some of which have more dollar values than others. <laughs> yeah, and that, that connects to what Bre uh, Ben's saying, like, what's going to enable the indie dev to reach mass scale? Because you can add these features to your website. And he also mentions adding to the existing web stack and um, you can do that by attracting alignment instead of forcing compliance. And this is getting to the idea that there are some incentives here. 
like people have an incentive to upgrade. You're getting new features, you're going to get compatibility. Um, I'm just going to add these in your notes. <laughs> um, there is an, even though I'm saying it, to upgrade to braid. Um, you get new features, uh, new compatibility. And so that we can, um, we can create change by honey, <laughs> you know, rather than whatever the opposite. <laughs> Attracting flies instead of <laughs> uh, bad stuff. Uh, that, that's really something that I'm I believe very strongly. And when I'm looking at designing the spec, I'm also thinking I, it's very hard for me to get into the idea of saying you should use it like this or you must do this, because I think most of how this is going to succeed is by saying you can do this and trying to demonstrate the benefits of doing so. I think it is in people's interests to work together. I think people use the web because of the benefits of it. All right. To uh, uh, add on to that, the example isn't just you get to upgrade, I guess, your stack with the uh, new capabilities, but well, actually, yeah, you are upgrading your stack, but one of the benefits is those new capabilities isn't just for you. Uh, and your customers. It's also for the ecosystem. So uh, Greg stated at the beginning uh, that assessing network state as easily as a local variable. That's part of it. So by upgrading to Braid in your stack, then everyone else can uh, leverage your data or your state as easy as the local variable, providing you know your permissions allow that. Uh, so blog posts become version, people can kind of scrape that or subscribe to your blog posts uh, or, you know, whatever type of media it is. It could be like a comment section on a website and those comments, uh, people could subscribe to those comments or your Spotify playlist. If that ever happens in those wall gardens uh, fall down, <laughs> then uh, you could actually subscribe to your playlist, uh, things like that, or your tweets, subscribe to your tweets, pull them in, in other places. Uh, and, to speak on probably behalf of Seth, who isn't there, if I can channel uh, what I hope would be uh, one of the things he wants to see is uh, bringing in not just remote state as easy as local variable, but also remote files as easy as local files. or so even seeing state as represented as files, uh, which kind of becomes really interesting because you could simlink content on your own website to external content, uh, which uh, that's like a more ambitious uh, side project, but that's also where there's kind of crossover with uh, IPFS and with other things, which is this is a much lower protocol, yet it can enable some crossover of abilities. Uh, and that's to me is where it's really interesting how low level uh, it is and then how widespread uh, its uh, rosy fingers can be. <laughs> I have a, uh, I don't know, maybe the best phrasing is uh, a question. Um, it, one thing that interests me is a protocol around um, just textual messages, like without re any reference to how HTTP works. Um, would that be in the scope of, of Braid? Like is, is Braid an HTTP protocol or is Braid a, a larger product in which there exists this HTTP protocol, but also other protocols kind of geared around synchronization and even JavaScript libraries and things like is it the kind of ecosystem of libraries built around synchronization? Is, is Braid this protocol? Probably give a little, give some comments on my thoughts, and I think this is a wonderful question, Bray, or Greg. <laughs> I'm going to start referring to people as Braid now. I'm just going to get you all confused for everything. Um, so, there's a question of 
how much of Braid is HTTP? You know, do we have other protocols too? For instance, we have been implementing ways to express the same information in Braid messages, but over different transports, like over a WebSocket or over, and Brent and I have been working on a little WebSocket thing. And we've had proof for a WebRTC version two, which sounds great if you want to have peer-to-peer -peer data transfer amongst your clients as peers. And the even the HTTP version of the spec is called Braid-HTTP, acknowledging that we might have a Braid-WebSocket and a Braid-WebRTC. So in some sense, it seems like it's broader, but there's also a sense in which it's the same thing. And um, another way that we could look at this is that HTTP is a like a first version of something that there is a bigger picture there that hasn't been fully codified. So like, um, like HTTP came out and then after that REST came out, like REST was defined by Roy Fielding in his dissertation, trying to explain what made HTTP so great and what made it popular. And so he expressed an abstraction of HTTP. Like you could have different actual network messages here, but the basic thing that makes the web the web is that you have like multiple representations and you have client server and you're able to cache the responses. You have some grain of an object at a URL. You have a uniform way to act, to reference different objects so you can link them together. And this was what he called REST. It was an architecture. And I could also see that what we're doing is extending the architecture of the web. And I think that there's gonna be one of these there's such network effects to this architecture. It's kind of this natural phenomenon in the world. It's something that we all want that both is interoperable and also is easy to program with. So it has the incentives for people to want to program with it. And then it makes it easy for you to interact with other people's state. And so it has these incentives for people to build on it. And it's just this natural phenomenon in the world. And there's just gonna be like one dominant way of doing that. And I think so far HTTP has been the dominant way of doing that. And our job now is to expand HTTP and, and so by the end of it, you know, we might stop calling it HTTP too. Like maybe, maybe we'd even come up with a different URL specifier at some point too, or some extended version of that. But it seems like we're gonna take the information and construction and the architecture of the existing web and generalize it somehow. And so maybe we have that in common and the transport seems to be like whatever we have to, to use to get by. Do you have any other thoughts on that? I think it's a really good question. So REST followed the HTTP. It was describing the existing system. Is there existing uh, sites that are both using auto merge? Um, like sharing an auto merge document or does that not exist or is that not possible or yjs or something i'm just curious how you guys sort of came up with this uh design <laughs> i i can say um i'll say a little uh, to that um from my own perspective, the there are people who are using auto merge. I don't know if there are websites who are using. I mean, people. Um, I would say it's kind of in a niche community of people who. Um, I think the path getting there is uh, some programmer says, "I need to synchronize some state." They try to build something. It's hard. They look on the web for like, how do people do this? And then there aren't that many things that do it. Uh, and auto merge is one of them. YJS is one of them. Um, I uh, I think I started working <laughs> on this. I, I forget at the beginning whether uh, whether auto merge and YJS. Ex I'm pretty sure they did exist, and I didn't know about them uh, personally um, at the time that I started uh, being interested in in this stuff. And what I was interested in was well, Mike was <laughs> interested in but uh, it's easy to convince me to be interested in as a, a programmer, just in uh, synchronizing state, you know, just a problem of, just a computer science problem of how do you 
<clears throat> how do you merge stuff? How do you do what Git does, but better than Git does it? Git tries to merge things uh, on different people's, you know, different people write stuff on their own machines, they come together, they want to merge it. Git will make uh, guesses about how to do it. Um, and it was just kind of an interesting computer science problem to do that better because Git is super useful. And if you can make Git but better, you don't have to worry about merge conflicts. That's kind of that's kind of what brought me into it. Is to riff on that a little bit, I think maybe the connect. So maybe we're talking about what's the relationship between auto merge and this HTTP and REST vision, like. HTTP and REST is interoperability thing. Are people trying to make auto merge documents that are interoperable? And a way of seeing the connection in my mind is that the missing piece for HTTP and REST is dealing with changing mutable state. REST is representational state transfer. HTTP is hypertext transfer protocol. And they're both transferring a resource from a server to a client or from a client to a server but they don't give you any ability to stay updated when the thing changes. And if you take that idea of updating when things change, like that, that becomes hard. It makes sense when they first designed this stuff, they didn't bother to solve this because it's really hard to handle that problem. That's the problem with synchronization. And if you take that, and if you try to do some half butted solution, <laughs> then you might uh, not get everything perfect and support all the use cases. So it's hard to standardize a solution to synchronization that gives you part of the way because it's not going to support everybody. And that's why when, as a programmer, you, the first time that you go, you like, okay, I can't just do a, a REST request anymore. I'm going to open a WebSocket and write my own thing is when you have mutating state and you need to keep real-time synchronization. And as soon as you do that, now you have a non-standard protocol. And now if some programmer wants to interoperate with your state, they have to learn your protocol, read the documentation. Maybe you didn't even document it. You probably didn't. You might not have an API for it. You might not have distinguished access control in there in a nice way. It's going to be a pain in the butt. You don't want to support it. So um, to have a standard for synchronization for mutable state, we have to solve the synchronization problem. And we have to do it in a way that's going to be forwards compatible. That let's we can implement part of this and have some standard way of doing it. And then other programs are going to be able to extend it and generalize it to their problem space. And so that's why we've been diving so deep into CRDTs and these algorithms, because we want to understand what's a general protocol that we can build into and build through. And, um, and it does, I have the belief that we will have interoperating CRDTs at some point, just because it's such a great solution to synchronization. <laughs> and synchronization is a problem we're all facing. And I think we're going to want to have great solutions to it. We were doing a round robin, and uh, I think we lost Santi, maybe. Um, but I was wondering if anyone else was interested. I think I, I'd lo I'd love to hear Bryn or Seth as well. I yeah, I was just going to say I'm sorry, so sorry I'm late. I didn't realize daylight savings time kicked in in the U.S. and set my alarm for like. 8.50 in the morning here, expecting 9 a.m. start. And I <laughs> know it was an 8 a.m. start. Um, so sorry about that. No, we're, we're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, our, our American thing that we're, everybody hates. And <laughs> I'm sure there are others. <laughs> oh, we okay. do daylight savings too. We just do it at a different time and we go the opposite direction. So okay. um, that'll, <laughs> it'll be, yeah, it'll be two hours out in a few more weeks. And I'll get thrown again. Um, uh, what uh, we're going around talking about um, uh, the answer to which question, just to bring up to speed. What is Braid? What do you want Braid to be? What's your vision? What inspires you? We want to capture everyone's capture everyone's inspiration here and put it together so that we're multiple, we're, we're maximally enthused and uh, have all the content of our enthusiasm here, and then we can wrap this up into some homepage designs, knowing that we're excited about what we're making. Great, awesome, um, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can I can talk based on my notes from um, you know, or if did you say that Bryn hasn't hasn't spoken about this either yet. Yeah, I can jump in first if that's okay. great. 
yeah. Um, I mean, so much of what's been said already uh, echoes, you know, my feelings on this, but um, so I guess for me, like the, the top level heading is choice. Uh, and I mean that in a bunch of different ways. So <clears throat> I guess on at the highest kind of like philosophical level, I think we can build a better world if we commit to making as many choices as, as possible and finding as many combinations of different choices as possible. Um, it can help us figure out which choices are good, which choices are compatible, and how we can make things that are uh, greater than the sum of their parts um, through interesting combinations of choices. And I think that's what propelled me into peer-to-peer -peer tech in general uh, many years ago. Um, and, you know, it sounds like similar to some of, some of you that path led through, uh, well, Napster, Kazaa, BitTorrent, uh, and then finally to the blockchain uh, world where I've been for a few years now. And blockchains are interesting. I mean, they, or at least in their current, um, their current iteration, they, they bring a lot of advancements, I think, in terms of architectures of trust and uh, really concrete applications of decentralization that, I, you know, I guess they're just wasn't enough money behind before, et cetera. Um, and it's led to a lot of uh, experimentation and, and um, some really cool approaches to things that we didn't have before. Uh, but, and I know this is, this is changing to some degree, but it seems pretty slow. Blockchains tend to be monolithic right now. Um, like if you want to use Bitcoin or Ethereum, you have to use the same one as everybody else. And for, you know, for financial uh, transactions, that probably makes sense, maybe not always, um, but it's good to have some kind of shared record. But that's, you know, that's only one application. Uh, and so I think for me, what I'd like to see is an unbundling of some of the cool stuff that we got from uh, pushing blockchains forward. Uh, into smaller Legos that we can recombine in all sorts of different ways. And that to me seems to be what, uh, it seems to be one of the guiding principles behind Braid. Um, as some of the other folks have said on the call, you don't have to opt into all of it at once. You can opt into pieces of the spec, uh, just the parts that are interesting to you. And you don't have to, it's not like there's some global Braid um, there are many braids, and you can be a part of whichever braids you like. Um, and to me, that that's important because it better models uh, the way that that human beings and communities form and relate to each other. You know, it's like um, atoms form molecules, molecules assemble into cells, cells assemble into organisms. Um, and you know, having a sort of more organically inspired architecture, I think, uh, well, first of all, I mean, it seems to be what the, uh, the folks who built the internet were after originally. I think that was the right choice. Um, because it, yeah, it, it, mirrors, it mirrors how communities are structured, communities of all different sizes. And so I think what I'd like to do is take all of the uh, technologies of trust, you might call them, that we got from blockchains and combine those with a more organic architecture um, for information and, and uh, for building communities and things like that. Um, yep. Cool. I highlighted a few pieces in the notes here. Um, you got choice, and you're also talking about um, unbundling the cool view web technology instead of being a monolithic thing uh, i wrote the word voluntarily you want it because it, it seems like you want these small units to be able to voluntarily join and maybe that's even by organically mm -hmm. voluntarily join into greater units and that also um touches on uh, what we we're talking about before about incentives and creating the opportunity for people to connect but not 
not forcing and mm-hmm. yeah. So we, yeah, we seem to have a, a really strong theme here in our general ethos, which is cool. And uh, it, freedom also is ringing out for me in what you're saying, like free choice maybe. Yeah, free choice to experiment uh, to with experiment. stuff that might seem crazy. Oh, very cool, very cool. And that enables us to evolve. And we talk about organic things too. So that gives us evolution, organic forms that are experimenting and mutating. Yeah. Yeah, evolution's messy, but it uh, produces some interesting things, like all of you folks. <laughs> that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> highly evolved. <laughs> Or deviant, mutate a mutation. <laughs> Evolution includes the mutations. That's how it works. It also includes drift, where it's like the successful people just got destroyed by like a uh, a flood or a tsunami or a, <laughs> some other plague. <laughs> Evolution is very adaptive. <laughs> Well, that's actually one of the benefits of uh, history, which is uh, maintaining the uh, mimetic successes of a uh, previous culture that may have been uh, more successful or applicable in a time that was not uh, conducive to its success. Which is like one of the main things of why the internet is so awesome. It gives us that uh, record for the next civilizations or uh, all our own failures. Well, <laughs> if a comet were to hit, the internet information would be difficult to access for the people right. who remained. Yeah. We need to etch it. <laughs> yeah, what are those satellites? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's actually a uh, Microsoft uh, project where they, they etch it into a diamond or something like that. I think it's a diamond. Uh, so it's like a 3D etched uh, uh, diamond, which they're like doing. I think it's even just called Microsoft Prism, um, something like that. Yeah, in, in the fall back of uh, uh, EMFs. It's also very cool, <laughs> very off topic, I think. Um, yeah. But I, um, but one <laughs> slight flaw of that is the technology to read the diamond might be wiped out by the comet, but the diamond would remain. Um, okay, so I uh, want to, I think Seth, do you want to? Yeah, 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 I'd be happy to talk about some stuff. Um, I was just taking down some notes and I don't know, I feel like there's so much in here that is common between a lot of us. Um, for me, uh, I think I've arrived at this place from a lifelong war against software complexity. So if we have, um, if we've got complex software, then so complex software can only be maintained by large teams that are expensive to you know, work on. Google Chrome couldn't exist without the thousands of engineers at Google that work on it. Um, and you, the genie doesn't go back in the bottle. Like once we've got Google Chrome with 20 million lines of code or whatever it is now, it doesn't turn simply again to be able to be maintained by a small group. Um, complex software can't be mashed up. Like you can't take a complex program and another complex program and easily make them interact with each other like you can with simple programs. So I can take one shell, you know, I can take WC, the word count program in Unix, and I can take cat and I can mash them together easily because they're both simple, but I can't do the same thing with, you know, Google Chrome and Firefox. Um, like Alan Kay has this beautiful line. He talks about uh, in physics, they've got, um, is it? Uh, well, there's like, there's all of the, the laws of, um, of like gravitational motion that fit on a t-shirt. Uh, I can't remember who's, you know, um, what the guy's name is, but there's like, you know, physics. Here's all the physics. Here's all the formulas on a t-shirt. They fit on a t-shirt. Where's computing on a t-shirt? Like, what are we, what's our equivalent of that t-shirt? What's our simple expression of how to, 
you know, of the environment in which a program runs. Instead, we've got, you know, we've got these huge piles of software that we just add to every year, we accrete. Um, so I, I think that we're due for like, I mean, I was hearing what Bryn was saying, like some kind of great unbundling event of unbundling software from itself. And instead of shipping monolithic software of like, you know, facebook.com, here's, um, here's a website and a ridiculously complex backend service and kernel modules and all sorts of things as this one big piece of software. Instead, pulling it all apart into a series of small pieces that can be understood independently so that each of those pieces independently can be able to interact. And I can have um, a Facebook client talking to a, you know, some other backend. I can have a different client talking to a Facebook backend. Um, each of these parts should be able to be um, uh, small to keep us all sane and so that we can do more things. Um, like there's a, um, yeah, and then, um, and so there's this open question of like, can modern software work with the Unix philosophy of do one thing, do it well, um, have the right abstractions that allow um, complex software to be made out of small pieces of simple software. Um, and this is, a, um, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. So uh, for example, the idea of a, like the you know, inverted database model is taking a database and then ripping it apart into small pieces. Um, that's the way you could build a compiler like this where each part of the compiler processes changes from a previous part and then passes those changes onto the next the next step in the pipeline. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I, I feel like this is kind of what object-oriented programming and small talk was trying to approach years ago, um, but they didn't quite get it right. So Alan Kay insists that object-oriented programming was about message passing. OO was around like isolated and encapsulated objects that can then speak to each other, um, call each other's methods. I'm convinced that the like right answer, like the place that we're trying to reach is something like um, state that's shared and then distributed between programs. And then where each program can have a, um, uh, have a like synchronous immediate interaction with the data that it, you know, that it subscribes to and it understands. Um, and since getting this kind of idea, I've been seeing it everywhere. It's like an itch that just can't leave me. So I've done a lot of consulting work and pretty much every company that I've worked with I've wanted something this shaped. This is why I made Statecraft. Like, <laughs> like every program, it's like, oh, over here, we've got a uh, um, company that's making a, a blog that they want to be able to collaboratively edit their blog posts. And over here, we've got some automated car park system where you should be able to drive into the car park and the camera will see your license plate and the boom gate will open and it'll charge you money. You know, well, we need to keep all of the computers in the car parks in sync around the list of license plates. Like. This is an everyday problem. This is an every program problem to be able to take state, um, synchronize it between different programs, between different computers, um, and then be able to have it so that each program can just interact natively with the state that it's looking at. And uh, yeah, the problem won't leave me alone. And I think it's useful everywhere. And I've got this big hope that it'll make the, the programs individually simpler so that um, because we provide this kind of common um, like ligaments uh, between the programs themselves, which will help. Uh, and yeah, um, and it's like this combining of the idea of the web, which is like simple and network transparent um, with a lot of stuff of, uh, of local software where local software is, um, gives users complete power over the data. So the web gives you access to collaborative editing and so on, but with the catch of um, uh, some server somewhere owns all your data. Local software has this property that you've got ownership over all of your data, but you can't collaboratively edit it. All of your data is stuck. It's like stuck on the computer that you're actually on. And I feel like there's a, another way, like again, using this model, we can take those, we can get the best of both worlds. We can have network transparent software where each program can individually um, see all of its data locally and interact with it uh, without having to hand over the reins of control to anyone else. So yeah, that's, that's why I care about this. Really well said. I, I, I feel like there's a, a combination somehow of um, like, or, or maybe a, uh, an inherent property of um, what, we're, what we're creating here is enabling voluntary association <laughs> um, because the local, so, the local first software idea is, is in its essence, it starts with control and then you, uh, elevate towards cooperation. Uh, and I, most other forms of 
computation and networking and collaboration and control don't get those quite right. It doesn't feel natural and it's not human centered. So I really agree with that. That um, is ink and switch, right? Uh, local for software. Yeah. They're, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's a HTML blog post, but I think it's also a research paper, but they did a great job with that. Yeah. Okay, so I want to riff a little bit on these these last parts because um, I really like them, Dwayne. Um, this voluntary association, and you also said human centered, and you said that in local for software you get control, and um, I think that from like from the average user's perspective, like I think. Uh, and since we're all programmers, we have a pretty keen insight into from the programmer's perspective. We want this simpler thing that's going to enable us. And I think from an average user's perspective, control is going to be something that they can sense or something that we can sense. And um, we're in a world right now. So I think because we have so right now we're in a world where this whoever controls the data controls the user's experience. And that's the case because the data, there's no standard interface to data. And so in order to build up a big database and have a user interface, you require a large team of programmers because you're implementing your own synchronization protocol. And the only people, it's going to take a lot of domain specific knowledge, like if you're building Facebook, all the Facebook programmers have to get on the board with the same synchronization system. And so you need a large team to handle that complexity. Now by taking the complexity and breaking it down and creating some standards for it, so you can use off the shelf libraries to handle it for you that are interoperable, then it makes it easier for us to program together. And so as programmers, now it's like, oh, cool. I can program with you and I can program with you and I can just add features because as a programmer, I want to be adding features and I want to be contributing to everyone's experience. And that also means that as a user, you're going to have control to choose which code you want to interface with you because there's going to be so many more of them. And you can also write your own. And so with this great, with the freedom of being able to choose your code with the freedom to create code, then as a user, you're going to have the freedom to choose lots of different code. And you're going to have ownership over your experience and ownership over your data. And you're going to have this control. And that's going to mean that the, the web, the center of control in the web, you know, the masters that we are bowing to whenever we use it are no longer going to be corporations, but they're going to be individual humans. And we're going to have more of a human centered web where I am my own master for my experience. Um, Angelo is a master for his experience. Angelo just brought up in the chat this cool idea that if we have a chat that's shared between uh, his website and my website, then maybe on his website, if you view the chat, it's going to highlight all of his messages, make them bold. And if you view it on my website, I'm going to highlight all of my messages and make them bold because if you're going to my website. I want you to see me. I'm very vain and I want to give a really good impression and I want you to think I'm so cool. And wasn't this tweet awesome that I made? Wasn't check out this chat message. And so that's like I'm presenting a view of myself through the same data as is everywhere else. And you're going to get a really good taste of my ego by going to my website. Um, but if you want to just see your ego, you know, you'll, you'll view it through your website too. And so we're going to get this, this human centered perspective on the web. And because it's human centered and there's so many different humans that you can look through, the web is going to be very subjective. Everyone's going to have a different view. And you're going to find it to be easy to look at the web through other people's views because you can just go to their website or you can, you know, twiddle some features. Say, like, how are you seeing things? Which data sources are you following? And what weights do you put to different interfaces? And then we'll also be able to try on other people's views, like we try on their clothes. And there's going to be fashion and user interfaces. 
like there already is right now, but you just have to choose which corporate fashion you want to adhere to. Do you want to dress like the Gap, or do you want to dress like Abercrombie and Fitch? You know. Um, Uh, I, I kind of want to riff on that. Uh, you just reminded me of Winamp skins. Anybody? Yeah, for sure. So I want to put, <laughs> I want to be able to install an app on my computer. But I don't even want to call it an app because that's what we call them today. I want to install a program on my you know, Windows 98 computer by downloading it and double clicking it and running it on my machine. Ah, how far we've come. Um, <laughs> so I've been reading about CRDT use cases and the word serverless keeps coming up and I searched through the document a couple of minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, and there wasn't any mention of that yet. Um, but I think we've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, the fact that you can kind of just install an app on you. Okay. So when I got a website, I got a website before I got Kazar and, uh, I, I immediately realized that when I logged it, SSH into my website, I was on a computer in the sky and it was so much faster, <laughs> so much faster, right? That fast, even back in the, you know, 56 K days. DSL days, uh, you connect and it's so much faster and it still is today. So having a serverless app on a server, I think that's a sweet spot. And I don't know if we've really talked about that, but uh, yeah, you'd have like angelogladney.com slash Winamp and it would be skinnable you know, in more ways than just aesthetically, like functionally skinnable, as Mike was describing. And like, it would be a shared database. Like your playlists would be shared with other people. Guaranteed, correct. And I don't, yeah, we need that. And we don't have anything close to that. And like the problem with doing this in my old school way, and I've had WebSocket implementations. So I had the sort of like real time, but I was off in my own land implementing what I wanted to be like this. And I at certain points said, I can't do this. It's so, it's just too often to nowhere land. And then here you guys are, all have the similar ideas and are codifying the semantics of it. I wanted to say in terms of rest, as we were describing earlier, like is the braid the least complex solution to the problem? Is that what you guys are kind of aiming for? Because you've got this complex problem and you need to, you know, skip forward a couple of steps and make a big change in order to make it happen, but still sort of trying to keep it as minimal as, as making as few choices for the implementer as possible. Yeah, it, it seems to me that synchronization is a super complex problem. We want the simplest solution, but also part of the simplicity is that if you don't need all of as much, there are many, many layers of features that you can add to get really robust synchronization. And the simplest thing is to do just what you need and add just enough to the standard that you need. Progressive enhancement. Progressive enhancement towards yeah towards fully full synchronization across time and space. I, I want to riff off something Angelo just said, where uh, or like a thread in his uh, theme of talk is uh, this idea of with the Winamp skins. It reminds me as well of like Stardoc, uh, and even their first podcast was very rebellious. And it's interesting where like customization or like even your own subjective experience uh, is kind of a form of rebellion against what Michael said, where it's, you know, someone else, like instead of it being on your own locality, your own experience, instead it's on the tenancy of a uh, huge monopoly uh, instead, in which case acts of customization, like the early MySpace, 
uh, experience was like a uh, kind of it brings back this kind of vibe, I guess, of rebellion or even like graffiti work in a city. Uh, you know, people can view it as a, ne- a nuisance, but at the same time, it's the pop certain demographic of the population saying, I this is my space too, and I choose how to customize it uh, to meet my own expression. Uh, so I think there's like a an interesting avenue there where it's like this modern uh, feeling of rebellion again, uh, just reclaiming our subjective experience or even our right to customize our own experience, I guess. Yeah, I w- want to riff on that for a minute. I I feel like there's um has any, has everyone here read Snow Crash? Yeah few people um so in snow crash like the the main characters driving around and like each area of the country that he's in is like a different little fiefdom of a different corporation that owns that land and i feel like us as software engineers like i got into programming because programming is like casting magic spells it's powerful and somehow i've been cast into the role of like designer of small kingdoms and small like fiefdoms you know like it's it's like our digital fiefdoms are you know there's like the facebook land and the google land and they're like you know, on over here, there's Netflix. And then there's, you know, like there's these different sovereign lands and there's not a commons, like there's not a common set of roads and infrastructure. There is some, right? Like there are people who've worked on having HTTP, but um, I feel like the, like whatever common infrastructure gets created gets used by big corporations. And then there's, you know, like there's a little bit of giving back, but we need more that's that's empowering regular users. Like I, I'm not in this game so that I can be personally more powerful. I want everyone to feel like, you know, they've got these extra limbs that we have as programmers to be able to interact with the data that we're that we're, you know, we're seeing every day. And I feel like the the curve of history is going in the opposite direction. It's going towards the data that I see and interact with. Like I tried to extract my WhatsApp message history a few months ago and I couldn't get my what my own WhatsApp messages out of my phone, you know? Like I want I want to be going the other way. I want to be going towards more ability to mix stuff in and mash up programs and everything else. And I want to give people, I want to give regular people that same power that I have. I want it to feel like um, individuals are empowered rather than like the software makes people do certain things or think certain ways. And I, I don't know, like this is this like big theme in how I see programming, but um, yeah, it's like this open question of how do you do that? How do you do that? while making useful software and i think the answer isn't like you know make one giant stack the answer is um make an ecosystem like an ecosystem of small pieces of software so that anyone's invited to add their own piece to the whole puzzle um and then hopefully like at some point have some really nice ui so that it's really easy for regular folks to also see what's going on in the same way that regular people can understand the file system and they know how to copy files onto usb key um but yeah i feel like we've forgotten that in the modern web Um, I wanted to kind of riff or throw in a, a perspective because um, I, I, <clears throat> I felt it here as, uh, as Seth was talking. Um, it resonates very much with me, the, like the, how much I dislike information being kind of stored in servers that are not easily accessible by me. Um, however, um, another perspective, like the, um, I just wanted to kind of throw in that although I agree with those things, and I think that uh, the Braid project can sort of uh, help, you might say, in the idea of trying to make things more accessible. Um, uh, from my perspective, uh, what seems like is happening, the sort of, there's sort of two revolutions happening at the same time. I think there is a revolution kind of inspired with blockchain of people trying to grab more power uh, in the digital world, kind of grab back, it kind of fluctuates corporate versus user, you know, how, who has the most power there. But also at the same time, in a way, I feel like uh, CRDTs and all the, these algorithms that kind of are under this hood are kind of a recent discovery in the world. And they, um, they're kind of in a, they kind of merge in my mind, a couple of lines of computer science where you have like, source control where computer scientists are worried about merging their own text with collaborators that kind of goes from a cluster of source controls to it's at some point uh, people kind of center around git 
because Git is a huge revolution in how it's done. It kind of makes source control conceptually very elegant. You have this tree structure of versions. Everyone can have their own pile of versions. And when you come into contact with somebody else, you just throw them your pile of versions and it kind of mushes them all together and you get the merged pile of versions. Other source controls were kind of centralized. Git was kind of by nature decentralized uh, and had this cool property where you didn't need, to, you didn't need a central server. It was just the way it worked was so good that it didn't need that. Uh, but it was still kind of slow and you had to resolve some conflicts by hand, but that was fine because you're programmers and you're, you could take the time when the conflicts occurred to do it. Anyway, at some point in the future, CRDTs come along and kind of merge, you know, different ways that people are trying to do things or the, the desire to do things in real time with this style that Git has. And you get CRDTs that conceptually they work the same way as Git. You just have a pile of stuff on your machine, a pile of stuff on their machine, you throw them together and now you have a, a merged pile of stuff. Um, you don't need any centralization. And this brilliance of technology, I think is, uh, enabling, you know, no matter what it, uh, this technology, people, they're using it already and they're gonna to continue to use it. And I, um, like in one way, I kind of view, like when I hear talk of like a brave ecosystem, I, to me, as a programmer, it kind of basically boils down to uh, pipes that speak CRDT, like bases, basically places where I can say, ah, the way that I talk to this person is we're gonna synchronize around some object. and. I can do, I'll have some abstraction where I make changes to that object and it will seamlessly shuffle them back and forth. Um, I think that even if we do that, which I think we should, there will be like political games to play in the world of trying to keep this data unsiloed. Because even if people are talking in CRDTs, you know, Facebook is still gonna make it hard for me. Or I, I imagine they're gonna try to have, I'll have to somehow log in to those pipes. Somehow they'll they'll make it difficult for people to just app, maybe. Like I, I think that uh, creating the CRD, making the pipes doesn't guarantee success in the land, like that war will need to be fought as well. The CRDPs are here to stay and I think they're very cool. And I, anyway, um, I see Mike. I'd love to continue uh, on that thread. Uh, if, if someone would take notes, um, so, yeah, I don't. Uh, great, thank you. So, a, a theme that we've been bringing up here in the last few speakers have brought up creating this ecosystem that an ecosystem where we have broken down simpler pieces of computing that are interoperable. And this ecosystem, we're going to have simpler pieces of computing that you can access like files. Okay, the, the file metaphor was this abstraction created in Unix and Multics. That's a, it's a standardized way to access data, <laughs> persistent data. And the processes, so like your code is now represented in processes that can interact with these files. And that allows processes to interoperate. And that's pi the pipe was this, the, the big idea of like, oh my God, look how you can chain all these processes to get processes together into bigger things that all interact with the file metaphor. And so I think what we're doing is creating a new version of the file that maybe we're calling state because it's going to have in part of its native API the ability to change. And it's also going to be networked. So it's networked state that can change. And so that brings it into the web. So the web has resources instead of files. And it doesn't, neither of these have good abilities to have things change. And so it seems like we're seeing this new architecture. And what we're seeing is going to make this work is creating an ecosystem. And that's touching on, Greg, your perspective. Because you're saying, I see these two revolutions happening in technology, okay, blockchains and CRDTs and merging stuff, merging algorithms. And, but this, the algorithms themselves are going to be running into some barrier of politics. Like we can't get Facebook to just like change their whole business model. They're not going to want to do that. And so that opens the question to how are we going to do this? And I think we're going to do it by creating the ecosystem ourselves. And like we're starting with this group and we're starting to build some apps where we're going to be interoperating. And then we can invite other people 
to build this too. And we'll just grow this new ecosystem where the ecosystem consists of code and state, kind of like processes and files. But this will be live running code and state all at network URLs that we can all read and write or you know and, and interoperate from. And so I think that a big part of our group is going to be not just developing standards and not just developing libraries, but also developing the first versions of the state and the first apps and inviting other people to collaborate because we're going to be this growing wave of a new layer of braid leanness on top of on top of the web. And that this new web that is all interoperable and anyone can contribute to can inherently outcompete with any corporate version because we're going to be drawing on the thousands or millions of programmers in the world who can add way more features and evolve at a way faster, more diverse, more interesting pace with more trust than a single corporation can. And it's going to look a lot like how the web outcompeted AOL in like 1996. That was a time before that when all the interesting stuff was on AOL. And then after that, all the interesting stuff was on the web. And there's just, you know, this AOL thing just looked stale and uninteresting compared to the web. And we're going to be able to create that alternative too. And it's going to start really small and it's starting with us right here. One of the things I want to, uh, sorry, Greg, do you want to go? Otherwise I can riff. Um, I was making a short statement. I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't trying to uh, suggest that um, there would be any difficulty even in getting people to, you know, in order to, to fight the political battle. All I was um, saying is that that's, a, in my mind, is a, a different thing than the technology. Like the technology, I think, uh, is kind of, you know, would have come about even if this had not, you know, there is still interest in synchronization. Um, and also that the synchronization alone will uh, help fight a lot of that battle. Like, I, I think that it'll fight it. Like, people want that. Even Facebook is going to start using, if they're not already, they're going to start using CRDTs to do synchronization. Um, anyway. So when uh, Greg was speaking, I had some connections that... Uh, mimetic connections tying into similar ecosystem discussions that we've had. Uh, and as you, as Greg was speaking about Git, uh, you know, Git's this great technical ability to uh, kind of decentralize sync your code or your files, uh, specifically that code use case. But then GitHub came in uh, with its social network ability like it's like okay sure we do get but we're the facebook for programmers and we allow programmers to discover each other follow each other but actually comment and interact with that code that code now becomes a resource for annotation and if we're now looking at uh you know braid with that kind of same abstraction lens as git did for uh files Braid can do it for you know any generic state uh, then I think this annotated state aspect is one of these cool ecosystem app ideas. Uh, I've shared it before with uh, Seth and Michael, and I think maybe a few others, you know, running with Seth's idea of the file system uh, being the sim linked, uh, having a hub for like sim linked remote files uh, as your data or your state. But then actually have, being able to comment on your files or your state and then inviting other people to comment and collaborate on it before. And to some extent, Dropbox allows this. You upload a PDF document or some document to Dropbox. Uh, sometimes you can make annotations. You get a chat on this on the side. Uh, but you know, Dropbox did it for basic documents, and then Figma does it for designs. And all of these kind of companies are invested in kind of creating annotations for specific data formats or as social. Uh, hub and I wonder if the right abstraction for like synchronization or the right way to think about it is like the technical, uh, yeah, like state synchronization is the technical way of defining uh, socializing. Uh, and what these hubs kind of do is they take something technical and then add this 
social human uh, experience to it. Uh, so GitHub kind of did it. So kind of this braid hub, I guess, could be uh, this annotation of uh, any particular state you know, to annotate that data on top. So I'm not sure if that was a, a good idea, just kind of giving out this idea for the entire internet to like run on, but <laughs> it seems like, uh, it seems nifty, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's nifty too. And I, I think it'd be, I think it's really helpful for us actually to see these like concrete use cases. What do we imagine this future braid to look like? And I'd love to hear other people like maybe go through a little scenario. What do you imagine happening? Yeah, and just um, briefly. Um, sorry, uh, I was just going to jump in and say that I, um, I wrote a rant when I originally released ShareJS Share after working on Google Wave, and I said that um, like Wave took a few years to write, and if we wrote it again today, it would still take a few years to write, which is disappointing. Like, you know, that's not what progress looks like. And like Figma, the engineers of Figma took two years to write the CRDT before they actually made the application on top of it. Uh, and um, yeah, I want the water level to rise. Like I want it to get easier to make things over time that have these properties. Um, you know, it would be ridiculous today if for someone to make some local software, they had to implement their own file system and every program had its own file system. Like that would be crazy, but that's actually the situation we have right now with collaborative software. Um. I just want to jump in because uh, my idea has nothing to do with anyone's ideas and I haven't found a good place to insert it. Um, uh, I'm wondering if maybe we have connections here to other, um, I guess I want to say political regimes, people, software engineers, developers in other political regimes that might be interested in what Braid is doing and is not well represented here. The two examples I thought of were um, Cuba, where um, for a very long time they had no internet and the best way to um, get the news and to download cool new GIFs and memes and videos was basically uh, through a USB stick and um, you passed it around and everybody got a, got a view and got a download. Um, it was like a morning paper kind of thing. I, I don't know if they still do that. I think they have internet now, I, but maybe it's too expensive. So they still use the old way. I don't know. Um, and then the Great Wall of China got, got me thinking about other examples where um, people might want to have low down sort of low level um, state sync off of a, off of a network. Um, I, I know that other systems may be better suited for this, um, but I think we also uh, might have poor representation and so we aren't thinking about those problems. Yeah, that's uh, just to give an example of that uh, secure scuttlebutt or which uh, by Dominic Tarr. He created that out of necessity because he was spending so much time on his boat, uh, which didn't have uh, internet connection. So he wanted a social network he could use uh, while being offline for months. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, in turn, it's got, uh, they do a lot of evangelism uh, in disconnected communities. Uh, where they can have social networks is the same one of the same use cases with some of the cryptocurrency stuff trying to deploy it in disconnected communities where traditional things um, like oh, yeah offline transactions is one of those frontiers where uh, it's not intuitive to people in first world broadband connected societies but offline transactions are something incredibly important to uh, the de developing world or even if you're living on a boat We've got 10 minutes left. So um, this might be a time to start thinking about how everything is fitting together. And maybe if there are other things that we're missing, because we're going to be able to carry this conversation on offline too. I think we're getting a strong sense now of a bunch of things that we have in common. And I do get the intuition that there might be some areas that we just haven't fleshed out because the group think hasn't gone there yet. So maybe if we could take some time to reflect on where we're at and set ourselves up to brainstorming in the future when we're showering or taking walks in the woods. <laughs> yeah, uh, so one, the for Braid, uh, right now, to tie it into the, if we're still going to keep the, the 
agenda as the website or the intention or <laughs> as a website revision. Uh, what the uh, for Braid, the thing that I thought was killer was uh, your video, Michael, on uh, State Bus. Uh, I thought that was phenomenal. Is that that's like you got to out of all the links on the homepage, you got to click State Bus and then you got to find that video. I think having a video on the homepage to kind of, you know, whatever, however many minute video where it is just something which is like, this is, you know, the awesomeness of what this can do, uh, making that more front and center rather than hidden away. It doesn't necessarily have to be state bus, but even like someone could even just get like excerpts from this, I guess, branding call or excitement call or whatever you want to call it. And then just, uh, uh, be like you know annotate or you know put into a compilation video uh that would probably be uh you know good marketing as well um organizing the experiments that we have going on with the visualizations would also be really good um the bloop dot monster uh demo is amazing uh, i would love right. to see that represented somewhere and then uh um, we already have some of the visualization through um the animations on uh, braid.news currently braid.org that um that kind of uh, i think what that proved to me when i first saw it was um that there is some legitimate high power thinking going on here and um this isn't just like a cool idea um even though it is kind of just a cool idea i mean we don't have libraries that do what state bus does in braid yet um but uh there's there's a lot of foundation here. Um, given how much focus there's been, or I guess maybe consensus around the idea that opt-in is better and unbundling is better and making you know little Legos is better. If we could find a way to make that really explicit on the homepage, um, so that people don't arrive and they see all of these Legos as a monolith that they have to kind of swallow all at once. Maybe give them all yeah. kind of equal weight. I um, just, <laughs> as you were saying that, I uh, it sounded like a good idea that when one thought it triggered is that it might, it might also be a good idea to include uh, some, if we have any, something that you can run, some code. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, to depending on where it is, but I think if it doesn't have code, it will exist in the land of like, like if I were to go there as a program, it'd be like, oh, this is a cool thing to maybe come back to in the future when they have completed something. Um, whereas if there was something to download, some sort of library that I could use right now, uh, then it would be an entirely different kind of thing. It would be the site for this library and presumably there'd be a github page i could go to that would yeah i'd like to um highlight i think when, I, when we're talking a lot about what's missing from the home page right now given everything we're talking about like what's maybe what do we want to put some home page design work into and i think having we're, we're bringing up concepts of of showing how you can use it would be pretty cool and what's practical right now. Wonder so that's that's my idea of maybe like a, a nice focus, something that's missing from the homepage. I'd be very curious to hear what other people are thinking we want to emphasize. Yeah, I think I think there's a natural tension between the two things that we're trying to highlight. One is the amazingness of a working system that you can just download and use versus the uh, pick your own pieces unbundled, you know, this is, you don't have to have it all working together. You can just pick a piece and it, it can be yours. Um, I, I don't know how to represent those two, but it seems like a, a tension that we're uh, trying to portray. I appreciate yeah, it, that. It could go the way of uh, like that libt P2P implementations page where they have that table and then have, uh, you know, a flag or I think it's like a traffic light color for how far along they are to actually implement. Because we've got Bryn's work here on uh, uh, Redwood and that's phenomenal. And, you know, showcasing these different things or, you know, for the libraries or 
because there's I guess there's libraries which have inspired Braid. There's libraries that use Braid, and there's also libraries that are wanting to converge or implement Braid. Uh, and all those uh, three things are good uh, things to kind of be aware of, as well as those states, because it even it adds credence to hey, th there's you know smart people behind it, and they're kind of like yeah, Braid's a good solution here, and uh, this is also the progress of the different libraries. That sounds really great. I love both of those thoughts. And this um, idea of this table also connects to what Seth has been proposing an initiative of having a, a test page and showing how of all of our implementations, what they implement and how they interoperate. Yeah, I think the story we're trying to tell is you don't have to use more than one of these Legos, but if you use two, you can build a slightly cooler thing. And then three, you can build an even cooler thing. So maybe if we had uh, like a few demos or maybe even some of these applications we're starting to build that showcase, uh, you know, things along a continuum as far as what you're willing to opt into. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's also like braid as the connective tissue between the systems. And then there's like all of the stuff that we want to build on top of that connective tissue. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to get a bit of a sense of like what the, um, how the information will be structured on the site. And I feel like both of those aspects are really important. Like, you know, Braid as a way for this program to talk to this other program. And then also like Braid as an enabler of this kind of software that we want to create. So one of the, uh, uh, with having state for everything and then also being able to annotate that or synchronize that, one of the issues is going to problems some thought at some point should be put towards uh, how to deal with the problems arising from this new frontier as well, right? Like the frontier solves a lot of issues with the current status quo, but then also introduce some new hurdles because uh, otherwise you could end up with like, like if you, you, you could end up with like, say a dozen different indexes all representing the same thing, but on different people's stuff. So then it's like, how can we, either converge around like a data format or converge around some things to kind of like at least make sure that it doesn't just fracture off into infinity, that there is ways of, uh, of, I guess, at least in the foundational parts to kind of bring up together some thought on how to address uh, issues as it expands outwards. So maybe that could just be like a little area on the you know, on the website, which I guess is you know the hub for where people is to know, also on like you know uh, frontier thoughts or something like that of you know what are the unsolved problems or problems that are still to thought of, but problems is not really the right term. Just uh, uh, I guess I don't know <laughs> what the right term really is. Uh, it's, it's also like a, a on an academic paper, so the academics would know more, but like at the end you're like or further research or for further consideration <laughs> aspect at the end of papers, yeah. Yeah, future work. Angelo. I'm gonna have to bail uh, right as it turns four. So I just wanted to wave goodbye to everyone. Thanks, thanks for meeting. Bye, Greg. Thanks, nice chat. I, I've got uh, a couple things. Um, I wanted to mention before websub.rocks, micropub.rocks. These are the indie web uh, sort of like go there, test your implementation. Oh, and here's some reports of existing implementations and their test results. And it's in tabular form. And I forgot that the other night I bought braid.rocks. So we have that. <laughs> and I mean, I. I still haven't looked at the test cases you may or may not have written yet, but I think that there's some, we can do more than the test the server that you've currently written, Mike, and uh, start testing some servers and then report the uh, the results. Um, so yeah, there, there's a common sort of, I, I think they modeled it after some other dot rocks sites, but anyway, um, I dig that. But what I want to say is, as far as like that implementations subheader on the homepage, 
I felt like clicking through to those didn't get, didn't, didn't you know, uh, satiate my desire for uh, seeing Braid in action. So I really had to do the, have the, I had to dig deeper and I really only dug deeper because I met you guys that one night <laughs> and you guys gave me the sort of inside scoop. And I, then I was like, okay, there's, so I have no idea how to characterize that homepage without that because I saw the homepage after you, meeting you guys. Um, but so a friend of mine, I mentioned in chat, we're gonna, he uh, he's gonna be using my framework, but not the social network, not the canopy, not the like social network tool that I'm building. I'm gonna be using the social network tool for my website. He's just gonna be using the framework to build his own website. He's porting it from Flask. So I don't have a CRDT in Python yet, but I basically have everything else. So if I were to drop like a sync nine library into my framework, I would be able to synchronize a resource on my site with a resource on his site. And for the longest time, we've had this code name, if you will, for a project that we wanted to like, we wanted to go real time outside of the indie web. And this was before, you know, uh, I met you guys or knew about Braid. So we're gonna do it. The code name was goblins. So it'll be angeloglanning.com slash goblins. And we're just running with it. It'll just be an empty JSON store and he'll have his own client and I'll have my own client and we can just modify the JSON. And the other person will see it. And then it'll be up to them to modify their client to render that, whatever attribute I added, whatever array sequence I add. And that'll just be like, organic test ground, but in a public facing way where you could link to directly from the home page, see like a working sync nine to full peers. Is that what it would be? If we were both running, if, if, yeah, I still have to work out the details. I would love for it to be sync nine on the back, on the Python backend uh, between the two sites. But if it's the client, so if it's client side, well, it changes things. <laughs> and I, I'm still wrapping my head around those, but uh, yeah. Uh, is, is, is Sync9 packaged up in a library? Is there an NPM package where I could install Sync9? <laughs> There's no NPM, uh, we should definitely do that. That, yeah, the code it, works. We just need to package it up. So, yeah, it seems like it's yeah, ready to go, but I haven't seen it. Two hours to do. It's probably not. And that should be on the homepage, I think. <laughs> Even if it yeah. isn't sort of like pick up and go, yeah. if if it's like npm installable and there's somebody who's like using it on a website, um, having npm installed it, hey, yeah, I know that's what you guys are working towards. Um, well, but cool. I think Greg would agree with that. <laughs> I think that he brought it up. Yeah. So I, I think you, you're bringing up some uh, some additional you're building so you're saying like the implementations that we have right now it's hard to see how they fit into the braid vision and one thing that makes that difficult Dwayne brought up the tension between braid as this like consensus adopts some protocol standards versus all of these implementations that make things work and so it seems like we can put some work into articulating how those fit together on the home page and maybe puts one of these feature tables up or like one of these rocks things and show a bunch of demos and each one's using different features in different ways. And so this seems like, and this also feels like a way that we can be organizing our work together as well, since it sounds like, you know, we're all building code or somehow most of us, I think we all are writing code and, and we're also fleshing out some common vision here. So it seems like these use cases and common, go ahead, Angela. Uh, yeah, like we were talking about Bryn's chat. Um, I didn't go and install it, no pun intended. I have very little experience with Go. Um, I think it's easy to get working, but I would have to, yeah, I, I should. I should try that README. You have the entire demo chat thing spec'd out. Is it ready to go? I guess is always the hesitancy. The uh, the, the chat original chat demo, 
uh, that one works, but not the the desktop chat one also works, but I would have to hang out with you and walk you through setting it up. It's is there a hosted version somewhere where I could play with it? Uh, no, but I could put one up this afternoon. We Those are always nice, and I'm as guilty as ever. We need an actually portable executable of Bryn's work. <laughs> <laughs> Can do. I, I hope everyone knows what I'm talking about. It's the thing that lets you run an executable across Mac, Unix, Windows, everything. Is it Go related? I think it's C. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's C as well, but maybe I don't know. <laughs> uh, Oh, okay. Go ahead. Let's, 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 let's try to wrap up. Any, any last thoughts? Yeah. Uh, so one of the uh, things here is also not just how to scale the tech or even introduce, but also to scale the community. Because right now it's like we've got six to, I guess, eight regulars. Uh, and that's like a great number, right? Like, you know, people can collaborate. There's time for nearly everyone to be heard and things like that. But uh, as it grows, uh, obviously 20 people in a Zoom call becomes a bit more untenable. Uh, so some thought also needs to go to uh, how to do that, uh, scale with the human and cooperation uh, element of it. And one of the ideas I think that would be unique to kind of this open and collaborative uh, culture here at Braid is you know, list people, list their interests or, you know, their mission or their experiments kind of going in. And then they can uh, kind of be responsible for like, you know, as then the mini hub of other people interested in those uh, experiments or that same type of thinking. So that way, instead of one person like newcomers having to deal with interacting with everyone, they can interact with this appropriate person and then have relaying. Uh, so you kind of have like, you know, it's a hierarchy, but still like a flat type of collaboration, I guess, where it's like people can bump up, reach the correct resource in that hierarchy that they uh, need. Well, it's actually, it's kind of like flat at the top, but then, <laughs> but then uh, uh, distributes uh, evenly out. Very cool. So maybe a general way to say that is we could put people on the homepage and show what people are how we're working together so that newcomers can come in and interact with the people that are most relevant to them. Right. Cause there's, there will also be a lot of intimidation for people joining like working group calls, right? Like if they're just a complete newcomer, uh, I think for Angelo, he saved his feedback for like the end of one of our working group calls. And then we had like a big engagement with him, but if you're also a newcomer, then maybe as well, like the feedback or the questions isn't particularly appropriate for uh, that time slot. So, as more newcomers join, we have to figure out ways to onboard them and also direct them to the people or the technical resources that is appropriate um, as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. All of that. All right, last call for thoughts until I stop recording. That was fun. <laughs> Very fun. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I feel like uh, I, I now have personally, like I have a really much better idea now about what we can do on the homepage. Um, that must have been super hard for me to do myself. And so probably for any of us to do it ourselves. Um, I haven't also, I have also, this is probably the most I've seen all of us come together and pull all of our thoughts together. And um, I see contributions from everybody. And so it's like, okay, I think that we all have some creative ownership in the spirit of what we're making now too, which is great. And I think we're all seeing the value of working together. Um, so I'm super happy about uh, everyone coming together, especially so last minute and making this. And, um, we'll be looking forward to working on the homepage design. So I think our next steps, um, we could all from this, I think, come up with some homepage design. And we can all can also continue to think about it and say anything that comes up. Uh, and um, I think uh, Ben's going to help post this to the YouTube channel. And if you want to riff on anything or if you have any thoughts later, go ahead and record a video and upload it to the YouTube channel too. I think these videos are a pretty fun format to do so. Um, and so I think coming up next, um, we just, yeah, we're going to have.
probably more thoughts about what we're doing and homepage designs that we want. And this is a cool open design process that I haven't seen people do much collaborative internet design before. I think there's a lot of open source collaboration for programmers that don't have good user interfaces. So to me, this feels cutting edge in open source collaboration. I know there's some design work that's you know been done in open source, but this is new to me. So um, thanks for participating in this. And I want to see how far we can take it. And maybe this is a design wave of the future as well. A lot of what we're creating is these little piecemeal Bravely units where we can create new designs and collaborate and add features to existing software from far away. So that's probably also capturing some of the future that we're creating too. Thank you so much for organizing, Mike. Um, really appreciate all of the work that you put into both making today happen and also making this happen as a whole. It feels really important. Thank you, Seth. All right. See you all on the internet again next time. Bye. See you guys. See you guys. <laughs>